gotta live with your choices. It's a, I got a whole album. He thinks that it. Yeah, do I realize that? No, yeah, I, and I didn't even do my vocal warm ups yet. <laughs> Imagine how silky smooth that voice will sound. <laughs> How's it going, Gia? It's going great. I'm so glad we could continue this conversation on the same day that we recorded the first half of it. But we even changed clothes. I know. Well, we want people to think that uh, we do this on different days, but really we just sit in the studio all day recording. Yeah. We've yeah. been here uh, about 43 hours. Uh-huh. So. And we're just getting to our 40th minute of content because that's how much goes <laughs> into making. We have to stop it and start it so many times. <laughs> how, are you? how are you doing, Amanda? Great. Yeah, you've been blowing it up on LinkedIn. People have been loving your posts. Oh, yeah, you think so? Uh, I mean, they think so. People that work here. Yeah, people love it. They're so thoughtful and caring, mm. and, I, and I love that about you. Well, oh, that's really kind of you. Thank you. You gotta put positive stuff out there, you know? Uh, I, th- I agree that you should, and I think you do a great job doing that. Thank you. Just so you all know, you should follow Amanda Hosenfeld on LinkedIn. She's great. You should follow Compliance Line on LinkedIn. Go for it. Like, there's a lot of stuff that clients one puts out there mm-hmm. like those videos that you and nick do are fire just doing our best to make the world a better workplace and uh... sometimes i watch those videos and i try to figure out who has like worse in the testing face oh i used your term this time. yes thank you uh i think i'm the clear uh can you call it leader winner loser in that I, worse I worse know. worse arts for me it's a uh, it's an affliction that uh i've dealt with my whole life it's not uh, like an official disability yet but i'm working on it <laughs> you yeah. It? uh yeah well i've at least complained about it a lot so isn't that how things get done mm. oh i'm not at compliance line. <laughs> 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 okay so uh um, so would you support me if i ran on a platform for making angry resting face a protected class i feel like that you might have some struggles yeah. In fight for freedom. It is a struggle. I mean, I'm struggling already, so I'll just live with it. Yeah. We, got, we, got, we got bigger justice to get after. Yeah, I, you know, more than one person in my life has said, walked by my desk and said, hey, what, Amanda, what's wrong? And it's like, nope. And you said, no. Just my face. <laughs> it just looked like this. <laughs> just focus. This is just how I look. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's all right. Once, once, I mean, those people must not know you. Because you're such bright sunshine. Well, I feel like maybe tackling that problem in 2020 might be a little hard. <clears throat> and maybe we should look yeah. at 2021. <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's our year. The, uh, the justice for ARFs year. Uh, yeah, uh, there are much bigger issues um, than how angry I look all the time. <laughs> you and me, but we'll find the fight together. <laughs> yeah. Like our posters would take like zero uh, photoshopping. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's red letters everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, this is just how I look. It's, just, it's, it's not angry. It's focused. That's focused what I keep face. telling people. It's focused face. Focused resting face. Okay. We'll go with that. Well, thanks for coming back. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, we have had a really great reception to the episode that you were on. Uh, previously, I think we had like our highest level of downloads on it. Like the, mm. um, I kind of like to watch the um the line graph of how many people download our podcast and just refresh it all day I refresh it all day long <laughs> and like i get really excited when it goes from like two to like three. Oh, that's a big growth 50 percent growth it's a huge uh impact to my day uh-huh. and uh, yours just it didn't even like incrementally go up it just went zoom Oh, yeah. I hired 400 people on Craigslist to download it. Good. So, we pay them because oh, I need that gig. Yeah. Uh, not enough because I don't think all of them downloaded it. Yeah. Oh, they just <laughs> streamed it. We'll get <laughs> no, no. But cool. I'm glad people liked it. I mean, obviously, we're just trying to do this to help some. Like, what I realized is uh, the amount of time and effort that we put into, like, having really high quality in our services, hotline, issue intake, web forms, case management, all that stuff. Um, we're so close to it that just sharing some of the things that have become common practice for us over the past two decades plus can be a real help to people. And, um, it's something that I encourage our team about all the time that a lot of us have expertise that can help other people, but we got to kind of put it out there for, for the, to see that. Yeah. I think you have a great point. I was, um, editing our sister podcast, the ethics experts the other day. Download it. <laughs> it really, it's really good. And I think it was actually, it was the one that you, you hosted with, um, 
with Mary Shirley. Oh, she's awesome. She's fantastic. Yeah. And the one thing that really resonated with me that kind of marries with what you just said was compliance is kind of one of the only areas of a business where you don't want to keep your you know curtains drawn really tight. Right. You want to make sure that everybody is aware of your findings and compliance and ethics um, outside of your company because it can help make other companies better. Yeah, it's a really cool thing that I've seen in this industry. You know, like there are a lot of walls that we deal with just in the business or when you, you know, join a company, you got to sign a confidentiality agreement and all of that. And everyone's looking to make sure that like the competition doesn't steal your IP. Well, a lot of the things that we do in compliance, it's just having systematic, reliable, scalable ways to care for people, to build good culture, to help make sure that people have a safe workplace. And that stuff can and should be shared. Yeah, it's never never something wrong with sharing that information. Yeah. Making sure people are cared about. And yeah. More. And I, it's really cool to see that um, as we try to do things, like we're doing some executive roundtables and we do customer advisory boards and ways to help our clients connect with other people and share best practices that people are really open to it because what I've found is that the compliance officer at company A and the compliance officer at company B don't see their opponent or their enemy as each other because mm -hmm. they're competitors in the industry. The the enemy, what they're fighting against is, you know, the things that hurt their employees, the right. things the that, risk. the risk, yeah. Um, and we can really come together and kind of help each other fight that better without having to feel like we're competing with each other. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and you know, Kaylin, uh, Kaylin's back, by the way. I can't wait to have Welcome her back. Welcome back, Kaylin. Event. Get ready, guys. Yeah, Get ready to see those uh, subscribes and uh, views Just pop. Just shoot right yeah. up. Um, you know, Kaylin and I always say that we don't, it doesn't matter if you're our customer, we just want you to have a good workplace. Yeah. So, and, and I think that's shines through with this, with this guy. I had somebody reach out to me and say, hey, why are you giving all this stuff away? Why is it you're just giving your secrets away? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, that healthy workplace isn't a secret. It right. should be the standard. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that this Compliance Live pod podcast is part of that vision that, you know, there's not this wall up that once you pay us, we'll tell you some of the ways to keep your, your people safer. If you listen to the podcast for two or three years and, you know, take better care of your team and never buy something from Compliance Line, we're on a mission to make the world a better workplace. And we're not going to provide services to every compliance leader at every company in the world this year, but we can help them a little bit by sharing some of our findings. Absolutely. So if you're completely lost, uh, that's because you're stepping in in the second episode of our review of Compliance Line's new ebook, Top 10 Questions You Should Be Asking Your Hotline Provider. We covered questions one through five in our second to last podcast. Um, we did the, it was two shows ago, and then we did the live show, and now we're finishing it up um, here. So if you have not listened to that one, go back and listen to the first five. Um, those hook you, and then the the second five are where, where the money is, I think. Yeah, we're, that's, these reel you in if you're going to be a fifth into our boat of compliance excellence. Yes. How's that for analogy? It's, uh, we're, we'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not, I'm not one to plant questions, but if I was, I would say, hey, uh, the real interesting thing is I had someone ask me a question, this didn't really happen, but why are you telling all these things that are just gonna make your clients demand more of you? I mean, this is a bunch of stuff for people to say, hey, make sure that you're doing this right. Um, and my answer to that fake question would be, we welcome the accountability because we think that this is the right way to do stuff. And I think a lot of people out there, I know that I have vendors who do this, they're just crossing their fingers, hoping that you don't enforce the contract and compliance line cares. And we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna perform to the contract. We wanna to perform to your expectations and help you raise those expectations because that's how workplaces get safer. Before we move on, Mark from accounting, would like everybody to know that this podcast is sponsored by Compliance Line. So thank you to Compliance Line for offering this valuable space for compliance and ethics related content. Mark was actually over at my desk uh, earlier today and I asked him if he would like to come in and do a spot on the show and he continued to say no. Except he doesn't in the very Marcus, the Marcus way that he can. He just kind of looks at me and he says, no. <laughs> the mark way is you just say no with a sigh. Yeah. Okay. Well, we do appreciate him uh, approving the budget for us to spend it on this Compliance Live podcast. So 
Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. All right, so let's jump in to question number six. Uh, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you're not watching our uh, video, um, Geo's playing with my thinking putty that I keep out on the desk. And um, cat. we are not sponsored by Craig. Oh, yeah, no. Thinking okay, part we have to edit that one out. Yeah. There's probably some trademark on that. Probably. Um, all right, so question number six, what questions are asked outside the scripted process? So I want to elaborate on this one a little bit because I actually really love this question. So you should ask your outline provider, do you have a script and do you go outside of that script? And how do, how do your people know what to ask? And that brings it to what we do here, which is adaptive interview. Why is adaptive interview so important? So there are a couple of things that make it important. What we're trying to get at is when we hang up a call for, let's say, the initial report, right? We do follow-ups and all that, but we hang up a call in the initial report. We want to get that to the director, to the coordinator, to the investigator with as much relevant information as possible that's going to allow them, because what are we trying to get at? We're trying to identify an issue, remediate it you know, substantiate an issue, you know, fix things that are going on wrong in the workplace. So there are some different levels of how we can take a call and get paid for a call. We can just say, hey, we answered the phone and we took a name, call this person back and find something out. You can kind of step up and say, hey, we, we answered five really obvious questions that you told us to ask. So, hey, we did our job. So now you guys do it. We checked those boxes. Yeah, we checked those boxes and you can't sue us for not taking a call because we did what you told us to do. Or we could do the thing that we think should be expected of a professional team of expert service providers and also should be the thing that a high performing compliance function demands from any of their partners and that's hey like give me a head start on the interview like yeah. ask the stuff that i am going to ask if you don't ask it and that doesn't mean that we do the whole interview and we close the whole process and we figure out how to change a policy but if there's something that by us training our team, doing quality control, having the flexibility in our system and in our metrics to handle that call right, then the compliance officer is gonna be served best, the compliance program is gonna be more successful, and ultimately the entire workplace, beyond just the person who made that call or, or the person who perpetrated some violation, the entire workplace is gonna be better off. So that's why it's important, it gives us better information, uh, to get the team started so they can react faster, triage better, and solve more problems with less work. Yeah, we need to get that information over. And what we don't want to do is, if, if there's a situation where we have to call um, our clients and say, hey, this is going on in your facility, we don't want the client to say, well, what about this or what about this? We want to go ahead and preemptively have answered the questions that we think our clients are going to ask us. Yeah. So when we do it in training, we I always tell our, our participants to ask the questions that you would ask if this was your family member or your grandmother or your son or daughter okay. in this situation. Uh, if it were me, I would want to know who did it, what's their title, where it happened, where the injury is. I'd want to know every single detail right. so that I could you Wait, what is what is the, the tie to your family member? Why do you say family member instead of something else? Yeah, because I care about them. I love I them. Yeah. And I want I want to make sure that they're taken care of. Yeah. So you're right. that's, that's exactly what I never kind of put those things together, but yeah, you're exactly right. But it just came from your heart because because you're I, I think it's a great way to teach it. It's a great kind of handle to give them of this person who's calling might work for a company that you never heard of before, you worked here at a compliance line, they might uh, be in a state that you've never traveled to, they might be doing a job that you didn't even know exist, but we're part of the team, we're part of the solution that can help this person, and we should engage in that call like we actually care. And that's yeah. getting the details, not engage in that call like, okay, I guess I got to do some more jobs for one of these people. All right, what do I have to do? What is the minimum that I have to do to not get fired individually or not get fired as a vendor? Um, that's one way that a lot of people do it. And that's, okay, well, you tell me exactly what you want me to do and I'll do it. Well, if you care, you should be able to figure out some things around that. And we do training around it. We give people best practices and empathy training and quality control and ongoing coaching and all those things to help hone that skill. But really at the end of the day, like if I hire someone to, I don't know, dig a trench in my backyard for drainage or 
uh, go to a restaurant and ask someone to cook some chicken for me. I'm, I, want to, I want someone who knows how to do that job, not someone who I have to tell them each and every step and make sure you don't overcook the chicken and also make sure you don't kill the trees that are around here or whatever it is. I want to bring someone in, one in who knows how to do that and also knows how to adapt to the changes that come in because, you know, for our calls, every call is different for, uh, you know, um, if you're doing yard work, like there's a lot of expertise that comes with experience. And if someone's hiring a compliance vendor to do this, yes, you want it controlled. Yes, you want to be able to like describe what you want to accomplish and you want to have some standards in place. But also if you have to tell them every single thing to do in every single situation in order to get the bare minimum just for you not to be kind of pulling your hair out with frustration, that's not really a partner. And it's probably just making things worse for you. Well, these, you know, I, there's very few situations or scenarios that we can get a call about that are going to be satisfactorily um, tapped on to our client with five scripted questions. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like there's always nuance. There's always, um, you know, one of the, when I was doing my personal training, one of the very first calls I took was a lost device call where okay. we, we, you know, um, somebody calls in and says, Hey, I lost my laptop. Mm -hmm. And that's a very set, uh, standard of questions. Sure. There's 10 or 10 or so questions, but all of those questions have an and an additional adaptive question that you could ask. Right. And if you care. Right. And so that is that's where the magic lies in this kind of um, in this kind of role is making sure that we're going that one step. I, I always say, and, and I have um, those sounds that just came out of my mouth make no sense. I had a, yeah, it's fine. Um, there's this article that I wrote on LinkedIn that says you always just ask one more question. Okay. Just ask one more question. Um, you start with the standard question and then you ask one question after that mm -hmm. and then one question after that. And then that's, that's where your adaptivity really comes from. Yeah, and I think it's, a, it's great to be looking for kind of what is the biggest kind of outstanding issue that I need to shed some light on here. Um, and, you know, I think that if, or let's just say this, when someone comes to us and they've been in a very locked down scripted process where the compliance team, the compliance leader needs to figure out all of the individual things and rules and questions to define all of these things, sometimes they're uncomfortable kind of not forcing that structure on the process and we're happy to follow all of the structure if they want it, but they quickly realize that, okay, well, I actually didn't define every scenario and I have a, a logic tree of 18 questions. I could have 40 questions or 400 questions and it's not going to cover everything. And I think intuitively people know that when they're training investigators, we have an, we have, uh, you know, kind of an internal investigation uh, panel discussion coming up um, in the next month. And exciting. it is exciting. And we got some great experts coming on it to, uh, you know, again, just try to help people be better. But when people are training investigators, you give them some best practices, you give them some questions, and then you give them some principles. But everyone has been kind of trained, get it, huh? Uh, that, oh, well, the vendor, they just they just hire people who don't care. The vendor, had, you need to kind of force them to ask exactly what questions you want. And I think when you realize that, hey, I, as a compliance leader, I'm asking the intuitive questions because I care. My investigators are following the trail of this story, of this narrative, of these facts. Mm -hmm. uh, when you realize that your hotline vendor or your issue intake provider can be an extension of your team, actually, instead of just somebody who you're forcing to say words into a phone, um, it really opens up a lot of uh, just outperformance where people get a breath of fresh air where they're like, okay, yeah, I was always going through this thing where, okay, I have to define another question and make sure that they ask this question all the right times to, okay, these guys are digging into this enough and they're getting enough information that now I can kind of answer my big questions of what's the next step? Who do I need to, to assign this to? How urgent is this? You know, um, wait, like who should I kick off additional investigations toward and stuff like that? Right. It's a good question. Ask your vendor, hey, do you go outside? Do you call her outside the lines? still make a pretty picture yeah because it's it's all on the paper yeah. like it's all like there's a bunch of stuff that you're going to find out in the investigation so why this is maybe a better way to word this i don't know who wrote this thing but they should have said this instead i'm just joking i wrote it um, <laughs> um like what questions are you waiting to ask until you get a report 
and why are you waiting to get answers to those instead of getting them on your hotline? Can, can we ask those questions for you? Like, let's yeah. go ahead and do it. Right. right. Like, you know, what? Yeah, I think the the operation or the operative part of that is why do you have to wait until you get notification, until you assign it to somebody, until they see it to get that question answered? If someone's on the phone offering the information and maybe they're anonymous or maybe it's hard to get them back on the phone or whatever it is once your investigation team is doing it. And I, a lot of times the answer is, oh, well, we just signed up for this company and they told us we weren't allowed to ask those questions. That's not within the scope and their team can't handle something that complex. Um, and you know that's that's part of what people solve for is just oh well I can I can tell my team to get off the phone in four minutes and just ask five questions and then you guys do the extra work if there's work that has to happen in an investigation why don't you get it done as efficiently as possible instead of putting it all in your investigation team you know you brought something up and before we get to question number seven I want to elaborate on that a little bit we have brought on team members and agents from our competitors when mm -hmm. that was their their metric was I can get somebody off the phone in four minutes and I think I think we might have talked about this a little bit last time and um, when, when those individuals go through training they said well what do you mean I can be on the call for potentially up to an hour well you know that's not ideal obviously but if the story or the path that you're going down with your caller is an hour long because it's in a, some egregious compliance or ethics violation. Yeah, that is, 18 issues in it or something like that. That's okay. Like, right. we want you to be on that call for an hour to make sure that you get the pieces of information that are going to help our clients fix this compliance or ethics issue. Yeah, because that's what defines what we want. It's what's going to help, not what can we put some efficiency metric around and then dump it off to the compliance team. Right, so as, as you're evaluating your hotline vendor, like I think that clients or people that are, are looking for hotline vendors should really evaluate, well, is that time call, the, the time limit on a call, is that is that something that we really care about? Like for me, I'd rather them be on an hour-long call than a four-minute call, because what information could I have gotten from a four-minute call? Right, I get that. All right, question number seven. Uh, what service levels do you offer within or in addition to quoted or subscribed services? So you want to ask your hotline vendor uh, this question. So most companies add surcharges on mm -hmm. to kind of extra levels of service. Mm -hmm. Why don't don't we do that? So as a standard practice, we want to be able to offer everything that our team need, that our client needs to help their team be successful and their workplace be safe. So we have a lot of flexibility within our contract to say, okay, like we coach our team, find a way to say yes. So if somebody says that, you know, they want every call to be forced to be an hour um, and, you know, they, they, they want some really kind of specific stuff where we're, we're going to go drive and talk to each person in person, um, then obviously there's some stuff that's outside the scope of our contract. But for everything within reason around our service, we want to find a way to say yes. We want to find a way to say, hey, what do you need? Why do you need it? Can we do it within the scope of what we have? And it's not so locked down. Um, and, you know, it's just part of our philosophy that if we can help the compliance teams that we serve be more successful, then everyone else is, everyone's going to be better off. So obviously there are limits to that, but we explicitly put flexibility into our contracts and we empower people on our team to say yes to, you know, customization and changes to service levels and stuff like that so that our clients and their teams can get their work done rather than constantly being in renegotiations of, oh yeah, well, you didn't say that two years ago when you signed the contract, so let's open up a new contracting discussion. Why, why do we have such flexibility? Uh, because it takes better... It, like it takes better care of the workplaces and it's what people want. Like nobody wants to say, hey, this thing isn't working for me. Can we get it better? And then hear back, okay, well, let me send you to the contracting department. If it's within reason, if, if it's close enough, we build flexibility into our processes where we have smart people who care here. So they can handle, I mean, you see the Slack channel, we get new directives launched that, you know, everyone finds out about and then it's put into our system and, hey, keep an eye on this and all that. We build things into our system so that we can be flexible and say, hey, you know, uh, there's this issue in this region, keep an eye out for this thing. Or, hey, for the next two months, um, you know, we're probably going to see a bunch of these reports. Let's, let's handle these uh, issues a little bit differently. It's just a way to 
deal with the variability that's within compliance rather than having everything defined by what makes it easiest for us as a vendor. But how, how do we have such flexibility? Is it because we don't outsource? Is it because everybody is, is in-house that we want? Do you know what I mean? Do you understand what I'm asking? Um, yes. So I think it's we're able to do it because our entire company has been set up since the late 1900s to handle the complexity and vari variability that compliance leaders deal with. So a lot of other people who say that they provide a compliance hotline or say that they provide case management were kind of, they're, they're kind of, uh, you know, a solution looking for a problem. They have a just standard high volume churn and burn call center culture and they say, well, what can we get these people to do? We say, well, what do compliance officers need? They need some flexibility. They need some specialization. They need people to be smart and care about what happens on the phone. And we solve for that by hiring good people and training them and investing in them and giving them coaching and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's really, yes, it's because we don't outsource our call center, which a lot of people do. It's shocking uh, how, how much effort they put into covering up the fact that they outsource their call center services. Um, it, it, it really actually is very shocking. We did yeah. test calls and it was startling. Yeah, it's like embarrassing and it makes me feel bad for those people who have to call those places. Yeah. But yes, it's because we manage all the people ourselves. It's because we have a whole process set up. I mean, you know all the stuff that we've done in the past five years to add another layer of quality control, to add more triage, to add you know different layers of expertise within our team and all of that so that we can handle this stuff. Um, so it's, you know, our operational process and ultimately it comes down to our people. Like, um, we demand a level of performance and empathy from our team. And a lot of people never hear that second word empathy and get burned out by the push on performance at other places where they have an average tenure of nine months and people will come in and just try to kind of keep the job long enough until they can find another job. Whereas people come here and they stay for a decade. And it's it's yes. it's part of what we do here. And when we can get someone to stay and get better and improve their skill and really hone a craft as an adaptive interviewer, then our clients are happier, our employees are happier. We can provide more flexibility, and then it all works. But if you're, you know, if everybody on your team is like nine months old or younger in the job, mm -hmm. there's not a lot that you can do. And those are these things are standard operating procedure for us. So because getting back to this question, we're not going to say uh, we're going to up your contract for adaptive interview. We're right. going to up your contract to make uh, uh, coordinate your calls on severity level ones. We're yeah, it's part of our standard. Right. That's that's what we're going to do for our clients. And if you would like to customize that, we're happy to do it. Exactly. And you know, part of it, part of you know, there's there's a theme throughout this whole thing. Um, you know, one of our core values here at Compliance Line is accountability, and I think that the world need, needs more accountability toward their vendors. And I'm not just talking about vendor risk management, which is important and we help people with. I'm not just talking about, you know, making sure that they perform to the contract and there's enough indemnification in there. I'm talking about you should be accountable for caring about what we care about. And a lot of people put a ton of effort into hiring a new person on their team at $60,000 a year or whatever, whatever kind of the rate is. And they want that person to fit in their culture and to be motivated and understand their mission and all of that. And then they hire a vendor for $200,000 a year and they say, okay, well, just do whatever I can force you to do in a court of law. And I think that there should be more accountability to saying, hey, you should do your job as well as I'm trying to do my job because your job affects my job. And that's part of what's all, all a part of this and that piece about, you know, what's included in the contract or what else can you do to help me get this job done it's part of what we do because that's the type of partners we want to be. Um, and we just think that's the best way to serve people. Right. All right. On the top 10 questions you should be asking your hotline provider, what notification options do you offer? So what, can we drill down on this term of notifications? What does that mean in, in our space? So the root word for that is notify. And that means to commute. No, I'm just fine. <laughs> um, so let's walk through the process. Tell me a lot of the lot <laughs> from notificatus. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's walk through the process. 
um, you know, let's just take the hotline. There's something similar that happens for web form uh, reports, but someone called the hotline, they uh, get a live answer. Someone's going to ask the kind of standard informational questions, get your location and your name and stuff like that if you're going to offer it. They're going to ask the required questions to make sure we check we check the boxes on all of those kind of standard things. Then they're going to do the adaptive interview, wrap it up at the end. Well, then that, go, that issue goes out to the team, and they're going to get an email notification for it. But there are a bunch of other things that, again, that we can do to help our client do their job better. So we do escalated notifications for what we call severities. So if something crazy is going on that like needs to get stopped right now, we're not going to let it sit in your inbox, sit buried under all of the notifications on your phone screen or whatever. Um, and we're also not going to let you sit around in a meeting or on a plane wondering if some fire is going off in your compliance organization that you won't find out until you land or get out of the meeting. So we're going to call you, and we're going to try to get in touch with you, and then we have a, you know, uh, like a phone tree set up of if we don't get in touch with you, who's the next best person to call? So we're going to make the digital notification right away, uh, you know, as soon as the report is typed up. But also if it's severe, we're going to jump in and make sure that someone has eyes on this thing because that's what we would want to do if someone was doing this for us. And I want to call out this, that we do make personalized notification to coordinators of our choice, but it's not kind of outsourced up to the supervisors. It's the court, when a coordinator yeah. is contacted, they are speaking to the agent that took that call. And that's different from our competitors, and I want to highlight why that's important. Why do you think it is? I thought you were going to highlight it. Or, no, I, I, <laughs> um, so, I mean, like, again, just think through it, or maybe think through how calls have gone when, you know, if you've gotten one of those notifications from someone who has no idea what was in the report, and they're just kind of reading a script to you and they say, hi, I have a report, number 279, someone said this. And they're like, okay, well, like, did they ask for anything? And they're like, uh, not here. Okay, well, were they angry or frustrated or just kind of, hey, heads up? Uh, yeah, I, don't, I wasn't on the call, so I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just contractually obligated to read these words to you and I'm going to hang up now. So 279 was very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, imagine that happening or imagine getting the person who was on the call for four minutes or 40 minutes and saying, well, what else went on in that? Okay, well, did you ask this question? Yeah, I asked that, but they didn't really say anything about that. Okay, well, like, did you get some sense for this thing? Yeah, well, we kind of got into that, but, you know, that's kind of, you'll, you'll see in the notes, it's in the second paragraph that they kind of vaguely described this. Someone's going to have that context to have that conversation instead of just, you know, reading a script and hanging up the phone. So we think that that's going to, like being able to answer those questions and have that context is going to let the person on the other side of the phone receiving the notification m take better action mm -hmm. to protect their team better and earlier. And we think that that's the best practice. And we think that skimping on that is uh, kind of cutting your nose off to spite yeah, your face. You lose half of the story when that happens. Sure. When the people that are listening to this call their hotline vendors and they say, hey, what, what notification options do you offer? Can you give me kind of a best case scenario and a worst case scenario of the, act, of the uh, answers they should be looking for? Yeah, the worst case scenario is easier because they, maybe they just say, we don't tell you. You're you got to come after us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like the absolute bare minimum is, yeah, we'll send you an email and just, you know, make sure you're always looking at your inbox or always checking the notifications from our app. Uh, and, and nothing, but still not great. Yeah, I mean, that's like the bare minimum. Like, if they're not telling you about them, that's a big problem. But uh, if they're just saying, hey, you know, like, what does it feel like, right? If they're saying, hey, we kind of put it, you know, we kind of dumped it in the box and you got to come check the box and see what's in there. Um, that's one thing. But if they are, so they should be notifying you, like, digitally as quickly as possible. Um, you know, like, how long is that going to take? Um, they should be helping you route these issues so some people want to triage all of their issues through one person and they reassign them the best practice is to you're going to have some algorithm for how you do that of everyone in this all the issues in this region go to this coordinator or you know this category goes to this person or yeah. whatever so you should be able to do that and do that automatically without a bunch of headaches to even like it shouldn't even be a headache to set it up um and then they should be able to do escalated notification that's not just a rush notification, like you should pay attention to the nuance of this. It's not just, we'll tell you faster, but it should be, we'll tell you directly to who you want us to tell with the person 
who has the most knowledge about that issue. That is going to get you enough tools and enough uh, kind of responsiveness to handle the variability that's going to come in the range from the kind of, you know, uh, the low severity issue of someone just, you know, saying, hey, I was wondering where the code of conduct is to the high severity one of, you know, there's a very intense, dangerous thing going on right now that that the compliance team should know about. And just tying it into question number seven, like we find, I mean, we can't, we can't tell other vendors what to do, but like we find that these are standard and they shouldn't involve surcharges. Like if you, yeah. if you want us to call your coordinator because there's a fire in the building or, you know, somebody had a messed up the diabetic meals at your assisted living facility and there was a patient harm, um, it shouldn't be, okay, well, that's going to be an extra thousand dollars a year to call. Yeah, we, we think that it should be standard. We think that if you, if you don't have these in place, then you're setting yourself up for more risk. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just a way that some people kind of hide charges and get people on the hook in a contract and then kind of lock them into it. And that's really not what we're trying to do. But there's, you know, there's another piece of this notification that um, you need to keep in mind. And I mentioned it briefly earlier, but like, how long does it, how long does it take for you to find out about it? Because there are certain things, if you're in finance or if you're in uh, healthcare or you're in a safety situation with OSHA or whatever it is, there are certain standards for how long you have to find out about an issue, to investigate it before someone can do a whistleblower report to the government. Or uh, you need to notify the regulator kind of before they find out some other way. Or you need to report all of these things within 30 minutes or whatever it is. You need to make sure that your hotline intake team is helping you meet those standards, not shackling you to having to run slower because you got to deal with how their processes are set up. Yeah, it's like layers of compliance, right? Like yeah. you want to make sure that your people are being compliant in your, you know, rules and regulations, but you also need to be compliant in your rules and regulations of yeah. new governmental entities, state bodies, things like that. Exactly. I think that's a great point. Thanks. I have to say thank you though, because I think, or I have to say that's a great point because you wrote the, you don't have to say it, but I mean, it's obviously, true, right? obviously, you want me to keep coming on and doing these shows. So, stroking my ego is <laughs> flattering. Look at your here. <laughs> All right, question number nine: What reporting is standard, and what enhancements are available? That's the question you should ask your hotline vendor. So, you said when we were kind of pre-gaming the show, you said something that really. Um, I'm not a reports person, so I'm like, I'm not a numbers person. So when I think about reporting, I think of, oh my gosh, just just tell me what you need me to do. Just tell me, show me the report, just tell me what you need me to do. Okay. So with the reporting, you broke it down into to this question. Is the reporting function for your hotline vendor slowing you down or making you go faster? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there's, um, you know, this whole reporting thing, is kind of core to what I think of as Compliance 2.0. So Compliance 1.0 is just do whatever the uh, the legislators are forcing you to do and whatever you can do to stay out of court and then kind of move on because you got some other stuff to do. Compliance 2.0 has become a lot about benchmarking and uh, you know trend analysis and you know report on what you're getting out of it and it's become a big part of the current focus and we'll talk about like proactive versus reactive uh, yes yeah that's so that's definitely a big part of it. more reactive and 2.0 is more let's look at these trends and be proactive yeah and, yeah and 2.0 is also about like let me get my ROI and let me make sure that I'm getting performance out of this. It's very kind of objective performance focused. And it's a good thing. It's, it's yeah. advancement from the just kind of check the box, stay out of stay out of uh, court stuff that, um, you know, 1.0 was about. Well, as that's come along, and we'll, we'll talk about 3.0 in a minute, but as that's come along. There's more, there's more .0s? Oh, there are a lot of .0s. Okay, gotcha. um, not, I know I'm using numbers. You're not a number person, but uh, we can do Tell me what you want me to say. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, as we've gotten into compliance 2.0, there are all these new expectations of I should know what's going on. I'm not just reacting to the reports as they come in, but I should be seeing, hey, how many reports am I getting? And where am I where are my hot spots? Do I have extra risk in this region? I should be leveraging the data that are inside of my system to make my 
uh, compliance program proactively better? Well, as those expectations have come along and as you know, it's built into software and stuff like that, well, reporting has become a bigger and bigger part of people's jobs. And that's part of what that question or that point that I brought up is if you now need to get these reports done, you need to have this insight into what's going on, if it's taking you a bunch of time to do those reports, yes, you're kind of finding it out eventually, but ultimately you got to do something with it. Ultimately, you got to react to it or change your compliance strategy for the year or whatever it is. And if your vendor isn't making that easy for you to download a report, build it, specify it easily, look at it, figure out, okay, what is this telling me? And then figure out what I should do about it and then solve that problem. Sometimes you get just stuck, well, I just got to get my reports done this month. Okay, I just got to kind of get this analysis compiled and the reporting is done, but what are the next steps? It's like, what's my conclusion? What should I do about it? And then go do it. So um, if your vendor isn't helping you get through that process faster, then you should be asking, okay, like, do I really have to put up with it this way? And our team, does, like, our software has a lot of customizations in it so that you can, um, you know, kind of run reports your way. Our team is super helpful, whether you call your account manager or you call support or you talk to client success or even talk to, you know, uh, the coordinators um, and our managers. Our team is very helpful in saying, hey, yeah, you can get at that. Let us pull a report for you or let us show you how to do it. Here, I'll record a video. I'll send you this report, record a video and show you how to do it yourself and then empower them to do it. Um, because there's a bunch of work after the reporting and a lot of vendors are bragging about their analytics and we got you know we got 85 different reports you can run that's great but how hard is it to get there a lot of them don't mention that like yeah if you want that you're gonna have to pay someone four thousand dollars to build that report for you um and also a lot of people don't realize that if you're going to rely off of on these reports that come off of the system you got you you got to do something with those, not just have a report that's printed, but go make a change in your culture, in your systems, in your processes. And as a vendor, we strive to help make that job easier, not just make it available to you can get the data if you like. Right. So we do, we have kind of standard reports that you can run. Um, do you want to use this opportunity to plug our new benchmark report? Is that a good opportunity to do that? Yeah, let's do it. I mean, I'll plug it, I'll, I'll, I'll plug it all. <laughs> so we just came out with our 2020 benchmark report and, um, you know, we, our client base covers over 5 million employees. We have hundreds of thousands of reports that we've taken. We've compiled uh, all of this information into a report that, again, we're trying to help people move down this path. So we're not just showing you the numbers. We're not just showing some graphs and a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, statistics to uh, kind of explain the formulas that went into it. We have all of that stuff in there, but we're taking the next step to say, hey, where's your number compared to this? What might be driving you deviating from the benchmark? And then also, okay, well, how do you remediate it? So if you're seeing a break in this issue, well, what should you do about that? Well, look here, look under this rock, see if you have a problem in this other area or compare it against this other benchmark metric within the report, and that's gonna inform this one. So we try to help you know, provide that expertise, help do some of that first and second and third step of the thinking, because there's always an, another step that uh, if we can kind of, just like with our adaptive reports, if with our benchmark report, we can give people some momentum going into this thing, then they're gonna wrap that whole project up or get more of it done this quarter than they would if it's just kind of sitting as a, oh yeah, I gotta figure that out at some point. So we're real excited to share it. We've gotten really good feedback of people are surprised at how well the compliance uh, leaders who partner with us perform. People are really interested to see our stats compared to what has been kind of the only set of numbers out there for a benchmark, which we, we think uh, is kind of an, un, an underwhelming comparison. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe risking, you know, we, we think that this industry report may leave people at risk of thinking, oh, I'm fine because I'm being the benchmark, when it's really kind of a sandbag benchmark. So we're really excited about the report. Um, and, you know, people can find us on LinkedIn or just ask us directly or uh, uh, go to our website and, and download that report. Yeah, it's really uh, cool. It, it makes me think when I'm, when I'm watching these videos about the benchmarks reports, um, it kind of puts a lot of things in, into perspective. Um, 
like our training, we, we talk about things like uh, anonymity mm-hmm. when you're when you have calls that are coming in. Yeah. And it kind of takes that concept of anonymity and puts it into perspective. Like, well, what does it mean when callers are anonymous? Right. I think that's really fantastic. Yeah. I, uh, I, I could see how that kind of helps paint the fuller picture, right? Because we're talking internally about the caller as kind of one of our customers to serve and how we need to do this. But this benchmark is really driven for a strategic leader that's operating or, or uh, kind of leveraging this program. Okay, well, what do I do about that? What does that indicate about the health of my organization and my culture? And how do I kind of, you know, take action to make things better? Um, so I'm glad it's helpful. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. All right, last question. We're reaching the end of the book. Question number 10 for the top 10 questions you should be asking your hotline provider. What added value do you provide to our compliance team? So you have mentioned this several times. I don't know if you did it on purpose, but during the uh, course of today's discussion, have said, you know, we're we're an extension of your team. Mm -hmm. And that is so on point um, because it's our our job or one of our jobs is to make our clients' lives easier Mm -hmm. for investigations. And if we're not doing that for them, then we need to evaluate that. Yeah. Right. So what are we doing? Yeah. Why are we just naming ourselves? I mean, we're not actually helping people get their job done better. And then we're just, we're just trying to like cash a check and that's not the game that we're in. I mean, you can take the compliance calls yourself. Right, as a right. compliance company, just you know, send them to the secretary or whatever. Yeah, and people do that until they figure out how many people are not talking to them because they do that. You know, why is it important that your hotline vendor is seen as an extension of the compliance team? Well, I mean, one thing is there's so much work and effort that's tied to this issue and take and case management thing. You got you have a bunch of people doing some investigations and checking out, you know, um, and reacting to this and doing training based on things and, uh, you know, assessing the health of your culture and all of that. So there's a lot that touches this. And, you know, I think that that's the case with a lot of vendors. There are a few vendors that just do the job and no one has anything else to do because it just runs. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know, the water at our uh, office kind of just stays on and we don't have to do a lot of maintenance on that. But a lot of our IT vendors and our telecom vendors and the software that we use, it touches follow-up work that someone does in their job. And if something is that tied to your whole system, the opportunity to get better value out of outperforming kind of the you know, minimum standard is really huge because it multiplies through all this other stuff. Like if you can get an investigation closed with us in 25 days versus it takes an an average of like 45 days with somebody else, that's almost twice as much work that you're doing every time a call comes through your hotline. And if, you know what I'm saying? Like it's like that with your investigations. It's like that with uh, your policies that, that are going to be informed by this. It's like that with, you know, lawsuits that might come up or whatever it is. When a vendor or a service is that integrated into touching extra work of your team for your team the the difference in your life and the effectiveness of your compliance program magnifies exponentially based on whether they just do a kind of also ran type of job or they do an awesome job for you yeah i it makes me think about like it puts in, into perspective that that term vendor because if you think about it um and another shameless plug for the, the ethics experts, because I was editing one of the ethics experts today, and the uh, conversation was around giving ethics and compliance a seat at the table, mm-hmm. whereas, you know, 20 years ago, uh, companies didn't have IT. Yeah. They didn't get a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. So when you're thinking about um, vendors as an extension of your team, um when, when we have a password issue or something on a computer breaks, we reach out to our IT team and they fix it. And mm-hmm. our IT team uh, or your IT team could potentially be a vendor. And, but we don't see it as we have to go to another company to get this done for it. That's just we get need a password reset and that's part of our that's part of our team that right. does that. Because it impacts our work. So yes. the lot, whether it's getting done by someone, the cubicle next to me, or on the other side of that wall, 
or in our company's office a state away or in a vendor's office somewhere else, it all comes back to us trying to do our job and achieve our mission. And there's so much in there's so much in compliance that touches the, all the rest of the company. Yes. And I think by extension, there's a lot in these this uh, kind of hotline hotline vendor conversation that touches a lot of the compliance team work. And I think when you take that view of we're all part of a team trying to get a mission accomplished instead of oh well you know we own this employee and we contract with this employee and then we buy this thing from a vendor and you treat those qualitatively different on the standards that you expect um, it might be a big reason that you're kind of struggling to achieve some of your goals as a compliance leader yeah I mean you don't ever want to say well they don't really work for us so I'm expecting subpar work right from them yeah I mean I don't expect that when I go out to a restaurant and say hey that that chef is not part of my family, so it's probably going to be terrible food. It probably would be just. No, if we go to your brother's restaurant. Oh, that's true. Oh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. What's the name of it? Uh, which one? Is, which which restaurant? What's the newest one? He, he's he's opening a restaurant called Counter mm -hmm. in uh, Rock Hill, South cool. Carolina, and it is at the site of the Friendship Nine sit-in protest. Okay. So he is. Um, ah. Yeah, so he is making the, uh, he's keeping, of course, the original sit-in protest counter, and it will now be a place where everyone is served and not not served. Cool. Okay, so, Love it. Yeah. So they Great concept, and he makes good. awesome food. Shameless plug yeah. into that. No, please go to his restaurant, because I get better Christmas presents when okay. you guys eat at his restaurant. And this podcast has been sponsored by Counter. Sponsored by Twisted Eats by Crete. Um. I forgot what you're talking about now. We were talking about yeah, yeah. the chef at the restaurant that's not your family. So. Yeah, I still expect the food to be good. Right, and yes, so that kind of IT analogy shifts things into perspective, you know, for me about what we do here is that when I say, oh, well, compliance line, they don't have a, you know. They don't catch a check from our company. Our company, name. company ever dot com email address, right. but they're, you know, they're still part of our team. Yeah, and that's what we want to be, and that's what we think. Listen, this is maybe not going to happen with every single vendor. Like, whoever the water company is around here, I don't really expect to, like, care about our mission a lot. But if somebody is supporting our systems or keeping our software live or, you know, helping us deliver service, I expect them to care as much about our clients and their mission as I do. So about this time, someone uh, logged in on the opposite side of our program and the audio got cut short. So in summary, what happened after that was um, some thanks and some pleasantries uh, with Gio. Thank you, Gio. We hope that you come back again soon. Please. Follow us out on our social media. We are on LinkedIn and YouTube as Compliance Live. And then we are on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Compliance Line. There you can find a lot of valuable tips and tricks and content to help you up your compliance game. Also, don't forget to go out and subscribe to our sister podcast, The Ethics Experts, where Nick and Gio interview experts in the field of ethics, compliance, and HR, and got some pretty interesting takes about their experiences. Thanks everybody for liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel and then also to our podcasts. We appreciate you more than you know. For Compliance Line, I'm Amanda Hosenfeld and Gio would say, I'm Giovanni Gallo and stay compliant. <laughs>